We want public servants, and we are going to achieve the American dream because we're going to take it. If not 2018, 2020, 2020 is going to be 20 times harder because West Virginians are strong, we are proud, and we won't give up. Hey, uh, my name is Jordan, if you're watching. Uh, I'm here with Paula Jean. Just so people could understand how incredibly tired you must be, you got in at two in the morning from campaigning. What time did you wake up? Five this morning. And you've been going since five this morning. Yeah. Uh, and kind of tell me about, we're gonna talk about Joe Manchin in a minute, but you've been at this for a year. Uh, you're a Justice Democrat candidate. You have been up against a I mean, David first Goliath, I think he had over four million in his campaign. Five million. Five million in his campaign. Uh, and you've had, I think... 300,000. Approximately 300,000. So tell me, when you say, even if, even if a loss, uh, you feel like it's, it's, it's a win. Tell me about that. Because we proved a point. Even if we do lose, the people of the state um, have rose up. Um, we have seen with the teacher strike, we've seen with all the union workers, everybody standing up and uniting, and they've done the same thing behind this campaign. And like I said, we've seen candidates from a local level to a federal level that's running for office. You've seen Sammy Brown, she's fire. And we have all kinds of women across this state that have just as much fire in their bellies because they're tired of the corruption. You know, one thing about it is, is you don't mess with West Virginia women and their young. And that's what's happened. You know, you see a lot, you know, we have great candidates, and I'm not trying to be sexist. We have some great male candidates, too. But you go to the state capitol right now, and mostly what you have is white, rich men in suits. And we have seen decades and decades of problems. We have one of the largest addiction epidemics in the country. But this is one of the sickest impoverished, impoverished states in the nation. And we've been promised prosperity, and we've not received it. And the only thing that we have received is corporate, politicians that their vision is tunneled into their funders pocketbooks so you know West Virginia's fighting back but like you see right now across America Americans are fighting back but there's an awakening in West Virginia right now we were divided for basic human rights there's some people in this state that don't even have adequate sewage systems um, they live in impoverished conditions comparable to a third world country that's unacceptable in 2018 um, we don't have no hope for no, pro no any prosperity and a diverse economy um, and people are fighting back. And also, I mean, people need to know this. I mean, the pharmaceutical companies, West Virginia is like ground zero for the, the pharmaceutical companies have funneled in opioids, uh, basically preying on uh, impoverished people. And uh, Joe Manchin has taken all sorts of money right. from Big Pharma, frankly. His daughter right. uh, is the CEO of Mylan. Uh, Mylan which was known for price gouging, uh, life-saving EpiPen uh, for allergies. Uh, and Joe Manchin basically told people when it came out that they were price gouging hundreds of dollars more for pills, let's have a fair trial. So the point is, Joe Manchin is just one of many corrupt people, but people are dying here. Uh, and I think finally your campaign, uh, I, I think they declared him the winner, but your campaign, it seems, is wake, it woke up a lot more people about uh, people like Manchin and, and, and the pharmaceutical company preying on, uh, frankly, struggling people. Yeah, well, we are dealing with one of the largest addiction epidemics in the country. And the biggest problem is, you're right, is, is big pharma in the, that, you know, in the pocketbooks of their incumbents. But it's not only Joe Manchin. We have the Republicans, too, Patrick Morrissey, Evan Jenkins. Um, all of them are funded by big pharma. And then they're shipping these mass amounts of pills in their communities. And you've heard from leaders tonight in long-term peer recovery systems they're putting the money back into drug replacement therapies, which are a vital part of you know the, the broad picture of, of recovery, but they're not putting the money into these long-term recovery systems. There's not enough beds. There's, not, there's no help for people that are suffering from addiction here. It's like they're profiting off people's demise. Not only, like I said, with the industry, but the same thing's happening with big pharma here in West Virginia. We need federal dollars to go into states like this to battle this addiction epidemic. And those, those kind of recovery systems, they need med medical providers, they need social workers. It's a, it, there's, there's support that we don't need, and there's not a clear flat path to recovery for people here. Great news. The uh, Associated Press just retracted just retracted their call of Joe Manchin as the winner here. 
So it's not over, as it seems. And what's so interesting, uh, I'm sure you can uh, comment on that, literally the corporate media all day, and pretty much this whole campaign, did not even report that Joe Manchin had a Democratic primary challenger. I watched CNN today because I like to torture myself. They were just reporting it as, who's going to win on the Republican side to take on Joe Manchin? Well, how is that news? I mean, when candidates run at big sacrifice to themselves, their families, and you're going all over the state for a year, uh, probably working seven days a week, and the news isn't even reporting that a United States senator has a challenger. Can you kind of talk about, uh, it's been an uphill climb, obviously, financially, but the news hasn't even really reported uh, widespread that you were running. We paid, you know, the people paid for my name to be on the ballot. The Democratic Party in this state has shown a lot of biases this year. There's been a lot of biases with the media, and that's part of the corruption in this country, and especially in this state, that the Democratic, Democratic Party is beholden to uh, corporate incumbents like Joe Manchin, and they don't give ordinary people a fair shake. Does that mean we're going to quit? No. But even with the media, there's a man sitting over there in a wheelchair that gave this campaign $2,700. Little old ladies gave, missed meals and gave $5 to campaigns like this because they want hope for themselves. And they want, you know, they want something different. And they want to be able to live and they want to be able to prosper. And it's a shame that these corporations and these media outlets will not even, this was a viable campaign. We had people working all over this state. And if we would have had a little name recognition in the media as well, we would have gained a lot, a lot of ground because that was the biggest challenge. I didn't go anywhere. The only resistance that I received was establishment Democrats. I had Republicans change their party affiliation so they could vote for me because West Virginia wants ordinary people. To, they want an ordinary person to serve them. They want a working class person to serve them. But they've been very strategic to try to inhibit my campaign, just like Joe mentioned when he was beat by Charlotte Print in the governor's race in 1992. He had, when he won, he, he lost to her. The Democratic Party treated her the same way. The media treated her the same way. And he actually campaigned for a Republican when he lost to her. So it's a really corrupted system. But this campaign has shown, even if we win or lose tonight, we have shown that we're gaining ground. And if we do lose, like I said, we're coming back. We're coming back kicking and screaming. And I'm just a small piece of a big puzzle. And West Virginians are tired, and they think they've won, but we will not give up. And I want to ask you, I've been covering uh, the past few days. There's a protest where a mother and a daughter had to climb up their trees in Virginia so that they didn't cut down the trees to put in a pipeline. Uh, pipelines are going through the Appalachian Trail. That's in Virginia. We know here there's coal contamination. The water's been contaminated. And it's getting to a point in America where citizens have to actually climb up and protest on their own property. That's not new news. I mean, we had to do it in the coal fields. People, people begging for clean water. We have to protest for clean water. And what happened in the state house here this year is if 70% of the community allows pipelines to come in, they're allowed to call it, they call it co-tenancy. They're allowed to take their people's property against their will. Our most valuable asset in this state is our people. And if these companies are going to be here, just like with the coal industry, they came in, they took our resources and they left. They destroyed our health, our water, our air, and our heritage and left us with breadcrumbs. And what I've seen across other parts of the state, and like this part of the state with the pipelines and the fracking, they want to do the same thing. They don't want to pay their fair share in severance. They don't want to take people care of the people in the communities. The jobs are not local. They're doing the, they, they bring in uh, mobile workers. So there's no benefit to this state at all. So that's, what, what, that's our plan. B. That's the only thing that they've offered us. No economic diversity whatsoever. You know, we've talked about wind, solar. We could manufacture those, you know, those here. We have potential for agriculture, agricultural hemp on mountaintop removal sites, um, biofuel. Uh, we, if we legalize cannabis on a state level, um, I know it's just a matter of, I think it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when it's going to be legalized on a federal level. But if we legalized on a state level, created a model like Colorado, that would get West Virginia out of the hole within six to eight months, we would see economic growth. Um, Joe did call me this morning. I called him and, and wished him good luck. And he did say, you know, no matter what happens, Paula Jean, I hope we can work together. I'm going to hold him to that. I'm going to hold him to that. I want, you know, if he, 
I've challenged him not to take corporate and corporate PAC dollars, and if he wants to really be a true public servant for West Virginia, then I hope he does swear off corporate money. And you said something uh, earlier that I think is important, because when I was covering the campaign in 2016, I can't tell you how many uh, Trump supporters at his rallies, I asked them, if not Trump, who would be the second person you'd vote for? I was expecting, you know, Ted Cruz or Ben Carson or one of those. They said Bernie Sanders. So I think what we're seeing is, uh, you know, conservatives are poor too. Conservatives have been screwed too. I think more of them are actually waking up to who's actually screwing them. And when people like you knock on doors, you said uh, north, south, west, east of the state, and you talk to people in their language, uh, people are warming up to people like you. I mean, you were outspent, it seems like, 10 to 1, maybe even more. But you're still, I mean, the Associated Press just retracted it. This was not called right away. So I think a lot of progressives who might be disappointed if she does lose, I mean, you literally uh, were a no-name a year ago, and you took on in, in an actual competitive way, I mean, somebody who had over $5 million for his campaign, not to mention the Senate leadership PACs funding him. What's your message to progressives if you do lose? Um, who might be dejected. Well, let's, let's take this back too. We have some of the establishment Democrats that are trying to get Don Blankenship in office because they think he's a weaker candidate to Joe Manchin. Did they not learn anything with Jim Justice? Jim Justice is one of the biggest political coal barons in West Virginia. Jim Justice, recu I mean, Joe Manchin recruited him and campaigned for him. And now he's our governor. He was a Republican. Two months later, he, he, he changed his party affiliation to Democrat. And now he's our, go he's our Republican governor. It's a nightmare to the people in the coal fields if Don Blankenship gets elected in this cycle. And the only person that was viable to beat him as, 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 as low as Joe was polling would have been me. And that would, have been, that would be justice for the people in the coal fields. Joe, you know, Don Blankenship needs his butt kicked by a coal miner's daughter. He didn't kill 29 men, he killed 52. And it scares me in the state that, this, that the, the establishment Democrat and the system and the Democratic Party is not serving the people. They would rather talk bad about the Republican Party, and they do not want to hold their incumbents and their candidates accountable to the platform of the party, and they have lost touch, and they're not serving the working class. And if people are going to campaign for Don Blankenship, I question humanity. And it's not coming from the Republicans and the political divide. It's coming from corporations and the establishment that they would get behind somebody that killed people in the coal fields. And just so you know, if you don't know the background to that, Don Blankenship literally went to jail uh, for his coal mine, which broke all sorts of laws. And like you said, 52 people died? 52 people. He has the worst, the Massey Energy had the worst safety record in our history. The, and it's, it's every- and The establishment Democrats, the Democratic Party, have basically been trying to prop him up because they think if he becomes the Republican nominee, that Manchin will moonwalk. So they're willing to even take the risk of putting this man as a, as a challenger to Joe Manchin. You know, during the anniversary of UBB this year, Joe Manchin was down at the UBB Memorial, you know, giving his condolences. But Tell people what that is, UBB. Upper Big Branch Mine Disaster. Um, 29 miners died under the leadership of Massey Energy. It was a methane explosion. And um, the memorial, you know, the anniversary was this year. And Joe Manchin, he was giving his condolences down at UBB. You know, I, I, we've seen Don Blankenship campaign on blood money. And we hear, you know, during these campaigns, I was sort of disgusted. You know, there's a commercial out with Joe Manchin talking about farm, the farming disaster where he, you know, he lost his uh, uncle. And I'm not faulting him for, for paying his condolences. But every time there's a re-election, it seems like these these candidates, these corporate candidates, want to get reelected on uh, off of our uh, our struggles, and they exploit us. I mean, we've we've I've said it. It's dance hillbilly dance. And somebody had said to me, "Well, Joe Manchin's going to be down at UBB. Won't you go down there? I bet you it'll make him nervous." And I said, "You know, I don't really go to funerals and memorials. You know, I wouldn't have done that before. And nobody better ever dare ask me to campaign." off the deaths of 29 miners. I know that pain. And every time the commercials, those commercials that were aired by Don Blankenship, the media didn't even stop letting him air those commercials, the radio ads, the commercial ads, on the anniversary of UBB. Every time 
those commercials aired and those radios aired as a consistent reminder of what happened to those 29 miners and as a consistent reminder to those families. So they're exploiting people's struggles and the deaths of people. When do, when do, they, when do they draw the line? When do they draw the line? I've tried my best as a candidate to keep my mouth shut this whole year over Don Blankenship, but he is a, he's the dark lord of coal, and Jim Justice is not much different. He just didn't kill 29 miners at once. He's killed some of my friends. And if, if he wins, I, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say about this state. And, you know, I think it's important to really make sure everyone understands, yes, Trump is awful, right? The Republicans are awful. But you can't defeat extreme conservatism if you have a corrupt opposition party. And the Democratic Party has basically been working overtime to make sure people like you don't even have a chance. They did it in Houston to another candidate down there. They've done it to progressive candidates, I mean, pretty much for decades, but particularly uh, since the Bernie movement exploded. I mean, that's not real democracy if you're basically not even putting your thumb on the scale, but putting your whole body on the scale to make sure that candidates like you have no uh, chance of media exposure. Make sure candidates like you cannot get in front of uh, potential sources of new funding that aren't corrupt. To, make, to try and uh, basically prop up Republican candidates instead of focusing on the Democratic primary. Uh, what's your message to progressives who might be feeling uh, dejected when, if uh, you and other progressives might not be successful tonight? Because uh, I've seen it a lot when progressives lose, uh, the, the viewers and people feel like, oh, it's all lost. It's always going to be this way. The vote is rigged. What's your message? We've gained a lot of ground and things, you know, this, things don't happen overnight. And I think through the elections tonight, even if I don't win, you're going to see a lot of candidates that are going to get elected that are progressive in this state. And that's a start. And like I said, 2020 is going to, you know, we've got 2020 and we've got the next election cycle. And we have to keep fighting. But we also have people running across the state for state, state executive committee in the, in the Democratic Party so they can change the leadership in the party. Um, there's different ways that we've been trying. But we can't give up. I mean, our children have no future. It's either... It's either stay here and fight or leave. Um, we've dealt with all this, you know, so much depopulation because things have gotten so bad. And I'm just one of those people that I'm not going to leave. And I, there's people out there that are not going to. And we can't give up. If we're going to have a future for this state, we're going to have to fight back. And that's why I run as a Democrat, because I wanted to fight back internally, because I knew there was problems in the Democratic Party. Last question. You've been all over this state. Uh, you probably, how many people do you think you've talked to at this point? I can't even tell you. My head's swimming. I've talked to so many. But I can tell you one thing that I've seen across this state. Dis despite our problems, despite the poverty, despite the sense of hope, I thought I did, you know, last year I felt like we had no hope in this state when I first launched and, run, you know, was running for office. I've never seen so much community involvement around this state in my life. And it's shown me that West Virginians really are strong. They're resilient, they're hardworking, and we, you know, we're not going to give up. Uh, it's amazing to me to see how this, the people in the state, I was humbled to see what, what's going on in the communities around the state, not only in the coal fields, but everywhere. Well, in my opinion, you know, I remember Bernie put out that call to action for people to run uh, as low as like the PTA level. And I think, you know, as a journalist, um, Journalism's a hard job, but running for office is very hard, especially when you're up against a Goliath like an establishment corrupt party. So I, I think it's very admirable what you've done. And I also think your story, we didn't even get to it. You're the daughter of a coal mining family. Uh, you've had illness in your family from the coal. I mean, your life has been an uphill battle. So I think you're kind of, uh, to me, and I hope the audience, a symbol of the corruption didn't come overnight. It's taken a while to develop. Oligarchy does not come overnight, right? So it's not going to happen like that, where you just get rid of them all. Uh, I mean, the fact is, Bernie Sanders, he wasn't known at first, and he literally won 22 states. Frankly, I think he won more than 22 states. He won all 55 counties here. Yes, Bernie Sanders won West Virginia. So Rome was not built in a day, but when candidates like you get out there, even if you don't win the first time, uh, you're kind of you're passing that baton to more candidates and eventually we do win so uh, I thank you for everything you've done 
and uh, I'm sure we'll hear from you again. So, any last words? Um, I just, no matter what happens, I just don't want West Virginia to give up. We've gained so much ground, and there's been so much unity across this state and people across America. Uh, and I want to thank everybody. I mean, it's been for, you know, not only in this state, but on a national level, we've had so much support. And I went in this with a purpose. Win or lose, I wanted to make sure that West Virginians had a national voice, that people knew that we were struggling here. And um, I wanted to raise the voices in West Virginia. And I think we've achieved that in this campaign. Um, they know about what's going on all across this state, not just in the coal fields. And I'm proud that West Virginians have had their voices this year. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it.